Hi there. We have about 36 participants on the line. Oh my gosh, this is so we'll fun. Let every, we'll let everybody <laughs> log in, test your, your video, test your mic a little bit. Can everybody hear me pretty well? Yes. Officially, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Laura Phoenix. I'm the executive director of Farm Table Foundation, and we are just absolutely pleased to have you all here tonight. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mike Scutt, who's an expert at running these sort of things, and he'll share some logistics with us. Good evening, everybody. I, uh, my name is Mike Scutt. I'm the program director at Farm Table Foundation. Thank Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's nice to see you all. Well, with no further ado, you are all here tonight because you know about Amy Thielen. She's a chef and a TV cook and a two-time James Beard award-winning author for her cookbook, The New, Me New Midwestern Table, um, and her memoir, Give a Girl a Knife. And she's joining us from her kitchen in rural Park Rapids, Minnesota, a place that's very dear to me and my family too, Amy, to prepare tortillere, which is a savory holiday pie from her favorite family tradition. And she'll talk to us about how she decided to return after working with some of New York's most celebrated chefs to cook and garden and teach from her home in Northern Minnesota and how she understands the importance of local food and supporting local farms. We're so pleased to have you with us tonight, Amy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. You guys, it's been really fun. It's been really great talking to you, Mike, about what you guys do. I've really enjoyed it. We've had some amazing conversations and I hope that we get to all of those things tonight. I mean, it's just a lot of what you guys do is very similar to what is happening in my area because it's a very rural area. And uh, I'm, always, I'm always just wanting to support these kinds of organizations, people who are growing things, people who want to buy those things and then connect all those people. So thanks everybody for coming to see me, but also for supporting the farm table, um, what they do is really important. So I'm behind it. <laughs> anyway, so I'm really glad to see you. I'm seeing some familiar faces and a lot of new ones. Some people I think I'm meeting for the first time from the internet and that's really amazing. I know it's, it's one of my Instagram people who always respond. It's really nice to see your faces. It's just great, really great. Um, this pandemic, if, it, if it's done anything, it's really bizarre that I'm actually seeing, sometimes I'm connected to people more because it's so virtual. Um, that's what happens when you live in the middle of nowhere, then a pandemic <laughs> actually becomes more of a connector. So um, today, I don't know if you guys have made the recipe, I know it was sent out. And the idea is that maybe some people might have started cooking some things so we can cook along. And you don't have to, you know, no pressure, obviously. And if you haven't started now, it's way too late. So just, you know, forget it and just, you know, drink a glass of wine or something um, because the pork takes four hours. So uh, I've got one in the oven and I have one on the stove and I'm going to just, you know, make it and talk. So this is my grandmother's, my great grandmother's recipe. Um, my mom and my grandma, uh, my maternal side, they always made this pie and it's a French Canadian tradition. It's, it's not French, it's got a French name called Portier, but it's really French Canadian. And I, if anything, that side of the family, we're not really, I don't really consider myself French. The rest of me is, you know, I guess German heritage. Um, we're really more like Northerners. We're like, you know, that side of the family came to this North American continent in like 1500, you know, so my mom, you really can't trace it back. We're like voyagers or something. So um, that side of the family, uh, my mom's dad, he actually died when she was three years old. And that's a really sad story. But I think it's important because, uh, you know, that's why this tradition became so dear and so important to my family. Because when grandpa died, you know, he had three, there were three girls and my grandmother raised them in Piers, Minnesota. And she really she did a lot to keep that side, the French side's traditions alive. And this is one of those things. So Christmas Eve um, in my family, we would make this pie. And it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot of pork. And I don't really know what happened in the translation uh, from the French to the Germans. If they made it more porky, it's entirely possible. <laughs> um, they might have. 
but I think it really actually, it was, it's all it is, is it's a pork pie, uh, it, but it's spiced with these like French, uh, four spices, half a piece. And the four spices are ginger, nutmeg, black pepper, and a little bit of cardamom. So, and all spice. So yeah, it's something that, uh, it brings up these like really strong sense memories for me. And in addition to this pie, we would also have the German side sausage from my family's meat market. I don't know if any of you guys no Thielen meats. Probably I talk about it quite a lot. Um, it's a smokehouse in Minnesota and it's very award-winning and it really is good stuff. It's like cold smoke stuff. So anyway, we would eat pork and pork and sometimes more pork. So this is just like pork one, right? So first we're going to start with the crust. I'm going to show you though. I don't know if you can see my stove. You probably can't. I have to like bring things to you. This is the pork that is the pork butt that I've had simmering for about four hours. And it's done, I'll deal with that in a second. But first we're gonna make the crust. And this crust is a little different than any other pie crust that I make. Um, it is, I call it Bev's crust. And that's because my cousin Bev from that side of the family, the French side, this is her crust and it's, it's the recipe that I put into my cookbook that is the most commented upon recipe probably in the book. People who have never made it a really good pie crust before, who have been unable to master it, you know, they, they call me in or not call me, they, you know, they uh, email me to tell me that they, this one is just like really great. It works for them. And it's an interesting crust because it's, it's just butter and flour, of course. But then you have a little bit of an egg yolk and some uh, milk. And the egg yolk has a curious effect of adding this kind of protein. So it's like a flakier, puffier. It's something almost between like a, it's almost like a pastry, like a laminate dough or something that puffs up a little bit. So I'm just cubing this butter. And for this, you know, for a lot of holiday stuff, I want to have halt, what I call holiday butter. Holiday butter being butter that's higher in butter fat, like Kerrygold, which is not what I'm using right now. It's more expensive, but it's deeply worth it. I know that Land O'Lakes has some. I can't get that here. Um, I mean, they have Land O'Lakes butter, but not Land O'Lakes high fat butter, which is what I want for Christmas. So, I'm just going to cut that in with a pastry blender. My grandmother would always do it with two knives or her fingers. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, some of these weird things during quarantine. This is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, I'm questioning pretty much everything, right? So I'm thinking about, okay, why do, why does everybody make their pie crust with rock hard, cold, like ice cold butter, ice, ice water. Some people say, oh, chill the flour, do it in a food processor. All of these things when pie is like, you know, this is like, it came of age, it became popular. And I'd say it actually kind of as a recipe came to be at a time when nobody had ice, you know, <laughs> nobody had ice. So I, I've been thinking about and questioning that. I'm like, really, does it need to be cold? What happened there? Is there some sort of lost? Did we lose something in translation? I think we did. Because my great grandma, she did not, she didn't have an ice machine, you know? She didn't even have like electricity on the farm. What I've come to, con the conclusion I've come to is that really what it needs to happen is you just need to have a little bit more fat you know, the only way that the reason that people do that to keep, you know, the uh, keep everything rock hard and cold is because there's just not enough butter. <laughs> either that or the ratios either have gotten whacked um, or, you know, butter, the water content of butter has changed dramatically over the years. This is like deeply nerd stuff. This is what I spend my time thinking about, okay? So butter content, um, the water, you know, they, they make the butter out of the cream and then they add the water back into it. And there's like a government 
you know, there's something like a, a ratio, like you have to add so much water into it. But, you know, back in the day before all these things were like really commercialized and you were getting butter from different places, like my grandmother got it from this little rock creamery, like, you know, people would get butter more locally because there were creameries, like a lot of these small towns, they all had creameries. So people's butter was often richer. And when you have that, when you have that rich butter and you don't have as much water in the butter and then you're making pie, you know, it just, it makes a more delicate, more fragile, richer, more of like a pastry than a crust. And at some point, I read a lot of old cookbooks. At some point, it was always like pie pastry. And then it kind of like, now it's like pie crust. And I just think that that, that word, that usage is like crust, sounds like a vessel. I'd like a pastry, you know? So my point is that I don't think the butter has to be cold. You just don't have to, don't overwork it, but you really don't even with, with a pastry blender. Okay, so you can see, I've been doing this for a while as I've been talking. And we have little pieces. We have some bigger pieces. Sometimes what I do is I just kind of like, you know, get it all in one place in the corner at the end so that I can get some really fine pieces so I know that everything's gonna stick together. But then I leave some larger pieces for flakiness to create little holes in the pastry, right? So Bev's crust starts with that and then an egg, but just the yolk. And this is a crust that I, you know, I wouldn't, I would not use this pastry. I don't know for like a, you know, a two crust fruit pie. I don't know. It doesn't seem like that. It's it's really good for savory things, and especially for this meat pie because it it creates this little bit of a, like an impermeable layer. So things are not going to leak out of it. And this meat pie, you don't want your pork juice to be leaking out and sogging the crust and things like that. And then you want to add whole milk. And what's funny is it's kind of a weird measurement. You put the egg yolk in the measuring cup and then you measure two thirds cup. You might not use all this milk, probably will. All right. By the way, you know, Mike, Mike said that, you know, if you want to raise your hand, I know that um, we're kind of waiting. I can't see anybody's raised hands or chat, so. If you want to just like speak out and interrupt me, please feel free to go ahead. I love like an open dialogue. Okay, so now you want to put the yolk and the milk. Now I'm going to hold back just a little bit. I might not need it, right? And I always mix it at this stage with a fork, kind of shaking the bowl like this. I love to make pie. I've been doing this. I mean, it was my job when I was like 10 years old. So it's funny how you, um, I don't know if you go through things, if you're, you know, there's always like this progression with pie or cooking steak. So now I'm gonna go in and see how it feels. You can't really tell from the fork. You have to get your hands in there. Start to squeeze it together. See how it's crumbly? I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? All right, just yeah, a little bit more. I'm gonna need pretty much all of it. Anyway. I was really good, I had really good beginner's luck with pie when I was young, like preteen. And then there was a time in my life where, I don't know, I just, I stopped working for me. It was always tough. And then later I finally figured it out again. So I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I, I did figure out that it's, it's the amount of liquid you add that makes it tough or makes it tender. If you add too much liquid, if your crust is too wet, too moist, um, it's, it's gonna to be tough, which is weird. It doesn't seem like that would follow, but it does. Okay, so at this point, you want it to come together. You want it to be a little bit of a struggle to come together, okay? It's not gonna be really easy. You want it to be like packing snow on a snowball, okay? And a lot of times what I do is I just press it right down into the bowl. And now this gives it like a minute just to hydrate, okay? And you see, when you press it down to the bowl, you're not like overworking it because you're not like, you know, grappling with it and packing it together. You're just pressing it down. Now, when you go into it, now it comes together super easy. 
So this is exactly right. See how it's like a little bit is falling off? That's what you want. Now you make a ball. I'm just gonna roughly cut it in half. Usually one is bigger than the other, but that's fine because one is the bottom and one is the top. Form it into a disc and you wanna press it down. So, you know, this is kind of like the French fressage. You know, they would, when they make a pie, the French way is when they make a tart dough is to make this kind of a drier dough like I've just made. And then they smear it with the palm of their hand on the board. I'm not gonna do that because this dough doesn't need it but it's pretty similar the way I'd like press it down, you know, into the bowl. All right, this one's bigger. This is my bottom guy. And you know what? The best thing to do, if I wanna make this cold right now, my Northerners know it, put it outside. Don't you love it when like your porch becomes this extra deep freezer? this huge walk-in cooler. Love it for the holidays. I'm just gonna, I'll be right back. I'm gonna throw it outside. Hi, Patty Amy. Hi, who Patty. am I talking to? Patty. Hi, Patty. From Minneapolis. Hi. <laughs> I have a quick question. I heard that over um, manipulating dough makes it hard too. Is that true? Or is that just a myth? No, it's true. It's um, it's especially true though, it's especially true though when you don't have enough fat, right? Because you think about it this way. So you've got flour and water, water in the butter. Flour mm -hmm. and water is what makes bread, right? They want to become bread. Like that gluten, the first thing it wants to do is it wants to be bread. It wants to be stretchy. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a short dough or a pie dough is like, it's like we're frustrating this flour, okay? With so much butter. It's like they can't bump, right? So if you have a dough that doesn't have enough fat in it, or if you overwork it like a lot, like I don't think I really overworked it, but I am like being a little rough with it, but I'm kind of being quick with it, quick and rough, you know what I mean? So yes, you want you want that fat to coat all those particles, and you want the fat and the and the flour to almost make a dough, and then you're adding just a little bit of liquid to just like bump it over to the edge. Okay. It, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. And Amy, we've Great got a question. question. I love I love talking about pie. Yeah. There's Go ahead, Mike. Right. Wade Berry wants to ask a question, and while Wade is unmuting himself, um, also Liz said that she had to add even a little more milk in hers as she's cooking along. So there are oh, a couple of people cooking along. Who's cooking along? Wait. Liz, she said Hi, she had Liz. a little more milk into hers. Oh, okay. Well, that that's okay. It, it might be because you you um, didn't uh, cut the butter in as far as I did. So if you want to next time cut in the butter a little finer, then you'll use a little less milk, but that's okay. Either way, it'll still work out. This is like a foolproof crust, really it is actually cheated and made it beforehand and I used a food processor to just shred all the butter yeah how that you know, and mix it was it good right? easy yeah. yeah you know I I like I use a food processor I used to do it more but uh I find now that I like the act of making it I don't know mm -hmm. for me it's therapeutic some people like get you know it's too much but like I feel like making pie part of it is just like I don't know make, doing going through this the uh, that you know ritual of making that mm -hmm. i agree i just i just used the food processor for the butter and then i did the rest by hand yeah well you know sometimes yes i mean i use my stuff all the time so you made the dough before how did it how does it where are you at with your process right now uh the dough has been in the fridge since three and yeah. the meat's sitting over here and i'm reducing the broth while sweet. you're it. sweet Okay, well, I'm gonna move on to this. So I don't know if you can, can you see? Yep, you see my meat, right? So Amy, gonna... Wade has a question as well. From oh, go Wade. ahead, go ahead. Uh, quick question about fat. Um, do you ever yeah. use lard uh, as one of your fats in your crust? 
Yeah, not with this one so much because you've got the added egg egg yolk, which is fatty. Okay. Um, you, you could, but I also have a lard crust recipe in my book. Um, and I think that one is online as well at the Food Network site. Okay. So find it. And that's an apple pie with a leaf lard crust. Um, mm. Do you have lard? Yeah, yeah. We have oh, nice. for our pig, so. From your pig and you rendered it down? Yep, we did. And Heidi makes a lot of pies with it. So it's a mix. You do uh, lard and butter, right? Mix of lard and butter. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. delicious. Yeah. yeah that's good. Yeah. So yeah, what are people, you know, how is Christmas changing for everybody? I would imagine, I mean, I'm not going to make the big smoked um, prime rib that I usually make for my feeling side of the family <laughs> because nobody's coming and we can't eat like the whole prime rib. So uh, I wonder how your things are, how things are changing for you with this, you know, with a changed Thanksgiving. I mean, Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, so what I did is I just pulled the meat out and now I have just that stock. So we didn't flavor the pork a ton. It's just black pepper, bay leaves. Um, the, the really that the sweet spice thing that comes in a little bit as we're going to reduce the meat and the juice together. And this is always how my mom did it. Seems a little counterintuitive to me. So, but it really is delicious. So we have, gosh, I might be really close to three cups here. I don't think I need to reduce this. And as we're doing that, I need to cook my onions a little bit more. I'll keep that going. you guys saw this does anybody know know what this is can you see it <laughs> this is one of my prized possessions does anybody have one of these and that's like a really old thing it's a diffuser i mean somebody should start manufacturing these these are really great so when i had that meat on the stove and you know how when you're cooking something for a really long time like that your broth or soup or any kind of braise on the top of the stove as it cooks and it reduces, you know, it, the boils, the, bu the bubbles speed up, it gets hotter quicker. And sometimes it's like this little runaway train, you know, and it just keeps getting hotter. And sometimes the lower, the lowest setting on the stove, almost all the time is, is really not low enough. So I got this from my great grandma. I, I wish they would manufacture these, like the handle's almost burnt off, but it's a great little thing. Okay, so I've got three tablespoons of butter and two cups of onions, which is like one large. I almost always use the daily onions lately. I just, uh, I don't know, I get sick of, you know, the storage onions, they're a little bit cheaper, but I just can't stand, they make me like, not just cry, but they make me sneeze. It's kind of crazy. Um, but the Vidalias are just like, they're so much fresher and they cook faster and I just really like them. So I'm just gonna dice up some garlic. Amy, what does the diffuser do? The diffuser, it lowers the heat. So it puts, I guess I didn't see, so like this. Okay, my camera's too far away. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you put the diffuser underneath a pan that's cooking, and then it it you know it's a little bit of a buffer and some distance away from the heat until it lowers it. So it, it's just like a very low simmer burner, basically. And it used to be a common thing. I don't I don't know why it's not anymore, but um, you know sometimes when you go to those like little small towns and you walk into a hardware store and they still have like the stuff from like 1970 with the <laughs> Aaron, my husband loves to go to old hardware stores. And uh, we would often find these places, you know, with old stuff still in them. That's where you might find a diffuser or a yard sale.
but yeah, so this year for Christmas, uh, we're all getting tested and we're being very careful so that we can hang out with my in-laws, um, Eric's parents. And I am cooking the traditional Norwegian family Christmas. And, you know, that's Swedish meatballs. So anybody else grew up with that? I mean, it's, uh, I didn't, but they're, they're really delicious. And I've come up with this new recipe. It'll be in my next book. So, and then everything else that goes along with it, which most of it is like this very pale stuff. And I add a little bit of color to it. Um, and we're having ludicrous, you know, my mother-in-law's like, oh, we don't have to, it's okay. You know, it's like, no, it, Hank has to have it. You know, there's really not that much going on this year. There's not gonna be a lot of, there's no cousins. There's, you know, it's gonna be pretty quiet. So, you know, having to try ludicrous might be a highlight. I'm so sad. I also really believe though in Christmas is, um, or any holiday, and I'm not assuming that everybody's celebrating Christmas, but mostly everybody's celebrating something, you know, winter solstice, even if it's the winter solstice, it's coming. Um, I just think it's really, it's important to make stuff for kids that challenges them instead of is an easy comfort for them, you know, because otherwise those holidays, they just kind of bleed, you know, they, they get lost in memory. But if you, if you make like something really funky, like liver pate or lutefisk or I don't know, herring and all the adults were eating these weird things, you know, and you make them eat the, I don't know, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a gag, but it, it's a little bit more important to that than that to me. I think that it makes kids, you know, realize that we eat some things, you know, we eat some different things that, you know, aren't mac and cheese or aren't just simple mashed potatoes and things like that. And, and it's part of who you are, you know? And then when they get older, when their palates aren't like so sensitive as they are, they'll probably crave it and they'll wish that they watched you make it, right? Okay, so the onions, you just really, I'm gonna kind of saute them. If we had, if time were no object, I would probably go slower with those, but I want them to be, you know, I want to keep things going. So a little bit higher. And now I'm going to cut up this meat, um, pull out like the really soft fat stuff. That's not good. Hard fat, good, soft fat. Yeah. And then you just want to dice it kind of large keep it not you know don't don't mince it i just cut across the grain and then i don't cut it again because as you stir it it's going to fall apart and you don't want it to be total mush it's funny but this is a dish that you know i've never had i've never had in quebec i've never been up there um during the christmas season but i know it's a very traditional christmas thing so I just have to rely on, you know, my mom. And then for my first uh, cookbook, my food stylist was from Montreal. And she confirmed to me that it was correct enough. <laughs> Traditional. Amy. Yeah. This is Patty. Hello. I just, uh, hi there. I just wanted to say, you know, you said you don't use the fat part. Um, but my husband's from Japan and he saw all that fat and he goes, oh, that looks delicious. I, I do like, I mean, I, I agree. I, I like to eat fat, like in a pork chop, pork belly, that kind of thing. I don't know. It, I mean, I shouldn't throw it away. It's probably true. Um, but in this case, though, it's been cooked so long, you know, it just, it's kind of flabby. So but like, now this, this reminds me of making head cheese or something, you know, like you have to distinguish which kind of fat are we talking about here. So now this like, this top fat that's a little firmer, that has some texture to it, that can stay in. It's just that really like flabby stuff that, I don't know, I get rid of it. But to each their own, it can be fatty. That's not a problem. I 
don't know if you guys can hear this. It's making little noises. Okay. <laughs> so I think I called for like four and a half cups. I'm gonna say, let's just use all of this. There we go. Okay, and then add some of the stock. And it's my mom who, uh, I'm just gonna add like, I don't know, a cup or so. Getting there. Okay. I think this is my mom's way of doing it. I know it is. I have to credit her with it. Um, I don't know if this is like a French thing. My friend Kendra, who's my food stylist from Montreal, she said she didn't know about it. But my mom makes it where you kind of, um, the meat just like soaks up that liquid, almost like a risotto. So you do it kind of slow. I mean, this is a, this is really a meditative thing. And it makes the house smell so good. You know, it's like pork and potpourri or something. It's pork and spices. What could be better? Okay, so now we're gonna make a little sachet. And these are the spices, this is the flavor. So uh, peeled ginger, fresh ginger. I'm gonna smash that to get all that flavor. Uh, I think it was two cloves. Cloves, you wanna be a little sparing with cloves. Funny, I used to work for this uh, at an Austrian restaurant in New York City. And I'm gonna put a bay leaf in here too. And I'm also gonna, I'm gonna put in a couple of carbon pods, which are not in the recipe, but I've been doing that lately. So add it if you want. Green cardamom pods and I just kind of smack them to let the flavor out. We're gonna gather this up. Use some string. This reminds me, the clothes remind me of, um, I used to work at this restaurant in New York City, my first job, and it was an Austrian restaurant. And the, the sous chefs were from Austria. And they thought that all of us Americans were just like the worst cooks ever, you know, because they've been apprenticing since they were 13 years old in some of the greatest restaurants working like, you know, 16 hour days, not going to school, just cooking. Anyway, I don't know, I put too many ground cloves on a carrot dish once. The guy just like his face, I'll never forget his face. It's just so shocked. He's like, oh, too much Christmas. So I was thinking cloves, too much Christmas. So you want to put this sachet in here. You want to bury it in the meat. Okay. All right. So the salt measure in the recipe, it, it's not going to be enough, but you want to, you want to hold back on it because that meat juice is going to reduce and you can't unsalt something, right? You can always go forward, but you can't go back. No going back. So I'm going to add a little bit more now because I can tell it's going to need more. And turn it down a little bit. And throw a little pepper on it. My hands are greasy. I don't know about you. If you're cooking along, yours probably are too. Okay, so now we're going to add a little bit of uh, herbs to this. Sage, fresh sage. I have to wash this knife. It kills me. And I don't have any thyme, so I'm gonna do a little bit of rosemary. I have a thyme plant here in the kitchen, but does anybody else grow thyme plants? This is the first year. I grow a huge, huge herb garden in the summer. But in the winter, I usually don't winter over a lot of herbs. And my gosh, it seems like you just can't, can't really use it. If you use it very much, things gonna die. So anyway, about six sage leaves. And then some rosemary. I'm 
just gonna stir that up. So you can start to smell like the ginger and the black pepper and the allspice. And I don't want to stir it too much because it's gonna get it's gonna get too, you know, too fine. And I'm just gonna check. I have a pie in the oven. I wanted to make one so that I had one, right? And I think it's like pretty close to being done. Yeah. Okay, not quite. Like you really want that middle, this meat. This is your like, you know, truth, truth window, right? You want that to bubble. And I'm not quite there, but I'm not going to let it go too much further because it's brown. But I have, I've also come to the conclusion that a lot of pie crust is like, it's too pallid. Really, the pie crust should be baked until it's nice and brown. Because, you know, I don't know, you see that on TV or in food magazines and it's like, God, I'm just like, it's critical. This is what I've been doing, okay? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, but I, it's too, it's too light. Like it can't, it doesn't get crispy and it doesn't have that pastry um, texture until it gets like nice, like frankly, you know, amber brown. So don't be afraid to take it to that level. I think that these are like the small things that make a difference. I have a feeling that our pie crust outside is probably already cold. So I'm going to grab it really fast. Okay, it is. It's a miracle. It's like a blast freezer out there, huh? And it's not even that cold. It's like, I don't know, 20. Okay, clean up a little bit. Can you see this? Yes, you can, great, okay. So we're gonna roll this out. I kind of wonder, I, I've noticed that, you know, during this, uh, how long has the pandemic been? I've kind of lost track of time, I don't know eight months, I feel like we haven't gone anywhere. Um, my cooking has changed a little bit, you know? I, for me, because we live really in the middle of nowhere and there's no rest, I mean, there's no restaurants here. The nearest restaurant is, you know, miles. There's like a burger joint down the road, but we just, you know, it's not really a place where you do a lot of takeout. And um, so, I've been, I've been accustomed to making our three meals a day for a very long time. <laughs> also, my husband and I both work at home. So it's, a, it's you know, this factory. Um, I've, I've been accustomed to that. I'm used to that. But I don't know, for some reason, it was really the first time in my whole life that uh, it's been, I actually, one time, a couple times, like, got sick of cooking. And that's when, you know, I mean, that's so rare for me. Like, it's really, I don't know if it's really happened at this level before. And I got sick of my routines and I started to see like, oh, I do that. Oh, I do that again. You know, you get kind of like in this rut. So, and to break that out, you know, break out of it. I don't know. I haven't been looking to things. I just do try to do things differently. What I like to eat myself is like Asian soups, like all the time. I love Asian food. I love cooking Asian food. I love to eat Asian food. Um, so when I get sick of things, that's what I mean. But I'm just curious, like, how has cooking changed for you, your relationship to cooking? So if anybody wants to answer that, I'd, I'd be very curious to know how it's changed for other people. One thing that I've been doing is, because um, my son is 13 and he's on uh, our son, he's on, you know, distance learning. And so he's doing school in his bedroom. And then sometimes after school, he wants to be on his computer and do his games with his friends. And, you know, it's a lot of time in his room. So I've been doing this like super fancy breakfast. <laughs> you get up early and sometimes I'll make even like biscuits. Um, every Saturday we've done biscuits and gravy pretty much. It's just getting a little heavy. 
but um, on the weekdays, I've been making, you know, pretty nice things, you know, eggs, something sweet, maybe uh, a little bit of dishy yogurt, you know, fruit, the whole spread. And then I set it up on the table with, you know, like real napkins, not paper napkins, and, you know, juice glass and water. I, don't know. I think it's helping a little bit. Okay, so pie crust as you're rolling it out, just keep it moving. You don't want it to stick, you know, flip it over maybe. And also I think it's actually, it's more important to flour the pin than to flour the pastry. It's always the pin that sticks to it. Always the pin, right? No matter, I mean, I'd love to find a pin that didn't stick to it. So seriously though, what are you guys making for Christmas? I am really curious what people are making. I want to know. I mean, besides this pie, right? Um, this is Patty again. I'm making your pie for Christmas. I'm, I'm making it's the fun. ingredients and then cooking it for Christmas. I'm this, making your pie. The sweet one or this pork one? Th this pork one. So I'm, oh, I'm prepping awesome. it now and then I'll bake it then. And that was a question I want to ask. Yes. Can you freeze the pie? Yes. Yes, yes. My mom always throws the pie. Okay. okay. To make it uh, the crust still, you know, crisp, keep it nice, is you're going to par bake it. So you want to par bake it until, until the crust starts to, it'll still look white or pale and it won't necessarily take on too much color, but it's going to look more like dry. Okay. And okay. And I would say like at 350 or 325, you know, in there, you're going to want to go like 30 minutes. Okay. So that you set it a little bit and then cool it completely before you put it in the freezer and wrap it. I mean, I don't know. I would wrap it in a lot of things, <laughs> you know, you know, freezers are just terrible. They, they freezer burn all kinds of things. So I would do probably plastic wrap and then foil and then, you know, freeze it. But yeah, you can definitely do that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Make it easy on yourself. Don't kill yourself this holiday. Okay, so this, you know, once you fill the bottom crust, it's always better to chill this. So back outside one sec. Okay, we're getting there with this. It's reducing. You want you want that meat to just like that stock. It has a lot of gelatin in it from the bones that you cooked it with the pork butt, and it's gonna just kind of adhere, right? Then you're also gonna shred one small potato into it. But first, we're gonna roll out this top crust. Amy, folks have typed in, uh, Dorothy's going to do a half lamb. Michelle's has a lamb roast. And uh, Christmas Eve, they do crab legs, wine, bubbly juice. Wait, say that again. Sorry, I didn't hear it. You said Michelle, frog legs? Michelle says they do crab legs. Crab legs. I thought you said frog legs. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, crab legs are really good, too. And then uh, Nicole's <laughs> does, does ice fish, some ice fishing on their lake for fresh walleye for Christmas oh. Eve. This is amazing. Oyster stew. Oyster stew. Amy, this oh. is Carrie in Boston. And, and for Hi. the first time in many years, we won't be able to travel back to North Dakota to see my family. So I'm we'll sorry. be doing oh. our, uh, yeah. Bummer. I, everybody's got their, their, their different traditions this year. So we're gonna be doing our big meal Christmas Eve with stuffed lobster. And, and kind of a modified feast of the seven fishes, including your smoked oyster dip. 
cool. Yeah, I love all the fish, the oysters too. I, I didn't grow up with that, but a friend of mine makes oysters too every year and I, I always get some from him. It's delicious. Very simple usually, but you know, nice and buttery. I love oysters though. I've been doing lots of, my brother and I've been doing, getting oysters from uh, different places out east or west, oyster farmers, and having oyster nights. You know, when it was warmer, we would do them together outside. But now that it's cold, we'll do them on Zoom and just like crack a bunch. Sometimes we do like a throwdown, east coast versus west coast. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a slurge, but it's worth it when you're not doing anything else. But I love all the lamb too. And Amy, um, Farm Table's offering some Christmas meals, and we're offering goose and ham, and the goose meals have absolutely flown off the shelf. They are so popular. People are just really taken by that, which I think is really charming. We're really happy about that. Yeah, I think people, you know, I, I think that this this whole time has really uh, sent people to the kitchen in a really good way. And also just got, you know, shaking people out of the ruts. And, you know, those are a lot of adventurous things. And that's great, you know. That's goose. I've never, I've only cooked a, wild shot goose and it was it was okay <laughs> but i do remember when i worked in uh that austrian restaurant actually in new york city we would do goose and it was delicious but it was a farm raise is yours like come from like a local farm or local farmers yeah that's right um yep and the, she's the chef Sarah's gonna do it with the orange it? glaze What's it? It? i'm curious who it is which farm yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you with that. I mean, I know Rooster Haven does some duck, but I'm not sure if that's um, duck that we have at farm table or not. White pine yeah. berry goose. That's the goose. I thought it was the berries. <laughs> All right, so this is my top crust. I, I want to make sure that the top is a little bit thinner than the bottom one. The bottom one, you know, can be just slightly thicker because it's holding all the juice. The top one is all about the delicacy, so you can go just a little bit thinner. And if you want to chill it, throw it on a sheet pan like this. And I can put it in the fridge, actually. Guys, my, anybody who watched the TV show, I don't know if there's any of those people here, but uh, if you did, remember my kitchen was like so tiny. <laughs> I never really, I didn't almost, I almost didn't even have to go off camera if I put things, you know, uh, in the fridge or anything. It was all basically within reach. Um, I remember like when we'd have parties, we'd have to like, when we're doing the dishwasher, we'd have to like jump over the dishwasher to get, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was tight, you know, cozy. But now I have a new kitchen and it's really, it's really great. I love it. Um, but it's large. It's definitely large. There's more steps and burning calories with everything I make. And it feels almost it feels a little fancy, but you know, Aaron and I, this is like the last edition we're ever gonna do on this house, so. Better do it right, you know what I mean? I think that that pie in the oven is probably done. So I'm gonna pull that out. Ta -da! I mean, it looks like a, you know, just a pie. <laughs> it's really, it's, a, it's not like this like, beautiful dish but it's very rustic and it's very powerful to me the spicing it should be when you're when you're finishing the spicing in this go high right you want you want to spice it fairly uh aggressively and it might mean you know the last that i the one i just made i added more because for me it just didn't taste like enough and i don't know why sometimes it depends on how slowly 
you're cooking the pork with this sachet. If you do it very, very slowly, like my mom did, it was just like, she'd just like draw it out. And literally it was like potpourri in the house, right? But that gives it time to infuse the meat, but I am not taking quite that much time, especially with this demo. So anyway, it's also think about this is that this is a dish that you're going to put on the table. It'll be warm, but you don't want to serve it piping hot. And also, you know, be easy on yourself. You know, it's, it's Christmas. So you want to just kind of chill out a little bit and you can serve it warmer than tepid, but like the warm. And you know, when, when things cool down, uh, they kind of get a little muted, some of those spices. So, so you want to spice it highly. And what would you serve with this, you know, to make it, I mean, this is something that I usually make too. Like in my family, um, we're quantity cook people. <laughs> Oh, we're not afraid of, of big pots and pans and doubling recipes, okay? Because if you're going to do it once, you might as well make enough, you know? And we're not, I don't come from a large family, but, you know, my mom, we, we made a lot of food. And my next cookbook is about cooking in quantity for uh, others, for other people. And hopefully it comes out right at the right time when this country, you know, comes, springs back to life and we are dying to have people over. I think it will, I know it will. Um, but I don't think it's any, it's not that much more work to make a big batch, right? You can always freeze it, you can always keep it. A lot of these things, just like this filling, this pork filling just keeps, right? And like you just said, who was it? Patty is gonna pre-bake hers, par bake it and put it in the freezer. So, I mean, even lately, I have a really small family, just three people, but when I make stuff, I make, I go big and then put it in the freezer because you get sick of it. You don't want to be eating those leftovers constantly, but you know, you throw it in the freezer and then you forget about it. And then it's like, Oh, I have a pork pie or, Oh, I have, you know, Indian doll and spinach, coconut spinach. And I got sick of it, but I'm not sick of it now. So that's what I do. All right. Where's my grater? I'm going to add the rest of that liquid to this. All right, maybe I can show this to you. I don't know that you can see it. It looks like a bunch of tan things, tan pan. Okay, so you're just kind of folding it, keeping some texture. You want it to be moist, not dry. but not too soupy either. So if it's a little bit soupy, you want to add a little bit of grated oil. Amy, people are curious about if the, you have a title book, if you can share it, but also the book release dates potentially. People said, I didn't hear you, a title? Yeah, and the book yeah, release. Yes. I don't know if I can share it. I think, okay, I can share it. I can share it. I mean, I'm actually waiting for like final word from Norton, WW Norton, my publisher, but it's going to be called Company. Um, and it is going to come out not this fall, but next fall. So we are just like, I'm in the final, I'm in the editing stages. And we're putting together all of the beautiful photography um, with all the words and it's going to be a large, it's going to be a large cookbook. It's going to be um, a little bit, actually, literally larger than my other book and quite a bit thicker. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited because W.W. W. Norton is a publisher that I always wanted to, it's kind of a dream for me because I'm a real nerd and that's a really good nerdy publisher. <laughs> They're really the only independent uh publishers in New York City. So, and I mean, the biggest independent press probably in the country. And I mean, they're just, they make good stuff. And their cookbooks for many, many years were um, led by a woman named Maria Gordon Shelley, whose daughter is Alex Gordon Shelley, who does uh, 
competition shows and has been on Food Network and all kinds of things. Um, she's in the media now and she writes cookbooks too. But her mom is this legend. And you might know that if you know anything about Alice Cornishelli because she talks about it. But um, my editor, after Alice, uh, Maria Cornishelli uh, retired, my editor uh, took over the program and she had, when she was younger, worked with Maria. So things are changing a little bit the way they do it visually, but it's going to be really pretty. And I had a really great time making all the photos with the team here. Um, we did it three times and put shoots. So it should be really pretty. I'm always getting these photographers to come way out here, but it, it, it's, I'll, po I'll post some more like behind the scenes things because I have some really good photos and things I want to share. And by the end, you know, you're just like so tired and super loopy and everybody's being silly. So I'll post those. All right. Stir this in. I'm going to grab the pie crust and be right back. I'm sorry, this takes so long. Five minutes and it's like stiff. I don't know. It must have gotten colder, huh? Is it colder? I don't know what, I can't believe I don't know what temperature it is. Aaron, when we moved back here from New York City, um, he had to get this fancy thermometer, you know, one of those like digital ones. And it would tell him everything. Cause he said that if he didn't have a thermometer that locally, like in our little hamlet of two inlets and just talking to his dad and everything, he would, with men, he would have nothing to talk about. He's like, I'm just like cut out of like all these conversations because I can't talk about what temperature it is. Because, you know, he calls his dad, he's like, oh, what'd you have there? What'd you have there? <laughs> you know, it's a real fascination. Like, oh my God, it was three degrees colder. It's 26 below here. What did you have? Um, yeah, that was a crazy winter. I remember uh, we moved back here in the summer of 08. And then our first winter here that we stayed here. And we had intended just to stay here one winter and then go back to New York City, but we ended up staying. Um, it got really cold. Like, I don't know, it's 09, right? I don't know if anybody remembers that being vicious. I, and I hadn't lived in Minnesota in the winter for years, you know? And I mean, not up north. And, you know, Minneapolis, living in Minneapolis for college or when I was younger, it's warmer. It's a lot warmer than up here where we had multiple nights all the time that were 40 below and the house was like crap, you know? And Eric would get up in the middle of the night and start another fire because, you know, had to keep it going. I just remember that. It was crazy. And that's when I learned that thermometers, most of them, almost all of them, they only go to negative 40. They don't go below that. So let's hope we're not going to get there this year, huh? Okay, you know, I really don't want to fill this pie right now. I just want to show you because what you want to do is, well, first you want to take out the sachet, right? It looks like everything else, don't leave it in. And secondly, um, you want to chill this down a little bit because it's going to be too hot, you know, because you're going to put like a hot filling on your cold, nice chilled crust and it's just going to be like, you know, you know, it's gonna get, it's not gonna be as crisp. So what I'm gonna do is just like Patty, I am going to par bake this. And then I'm gonna pull it out on Christmas Eve. My mom sent me sausage. So we're gonna have the double pork attack and hopefully some vegetables. <laughs> and I'm just gonna queue up a brief um, PowerPoint presentation. We'll share with you just a little bit about how We've been coping through the pandemic and what we've been up to at Farm Table Foundation.
I know lots of you have been to our classes before and hopefully to our restaurant as well and probably know quite a bit about Farm Table Foundation. But let me just briefly remind you that um, we're a nonprofit and our mission is to grow local food culture through education, research, and training. And our purpose is to rekindle connections between people and local food and farmers and the land. And we do this through our three major programs, our nonprofit restaurant, our events and programs like this one, and our art gallery. Um, and a little more about our restaurant. We're a true local food restaurant. 100% of the meat that we serve is sourced from eight farms within just 28 miles of Amory. We support local food farms by purchasing thousands of pounds of produce each year. And if you've visited the restaurant, you've been a part of this part of our mission. Um, so like Amy and the rest of you, we've gotten pretty creative in response to the challenges posed by 2020. The global coronavirus pandemic spurred us to pivot our operations away from in-person and indoor dining. So we built out our provisions and retail selections. We did delivery of food and orders for a time. We offered and are offering curbside pickup and lots of really great takeout food. A menu of take and bake meals was launched. And so families enjoyed heat and eat meals like pizza and shepherd's pies and pot pies among other things. On the next slide, you'll see a little glimpse of some of our meal kits. This allows people to do a little bit of cooking and guarantees a great result. Um, we paired bucatini with various sauces and toppings, and those have been very popular items. And the virus underscored issues with the food supply chain. You've probably noticed empty shelves in the grocery store. Maybe you couldn't find rice or sugar. And the industrial food system is huge and just not agile enough to respond quickly to disruptions. The shorter the food supply chain, chain which we support, is able to continue to make available hard to find items such as yeast and flour and eggs. And for several months in early 2020, we supplied the Amory area food pantry with cases of local eggs because their typical sources had dried up. And like our kids and other organizations and companies worldwide, we've entered the brave new online world. We've offered virtual classes on a variety of topics. The top three topics have been sourdough baking and gardening and a virtual art opening. And we've launched a YouTube channel where all of our videos have been posted. And since its inception, just a few months ago, we've had almost 4,000 views. And we've been able to deepen our impact through some new partnerships. Several new partnerships have allowed us to expand our mission impact. We've connected with a new teacher named Jenny Breen at the University of Minnesota, and we've offered a cooking series in conjunction with Kinship of Polk County, which is a mentoring program partnering young people with adults, adult mentors. Um, we've collaborated with YMCA camps, Camp St. Croix and Camp Icoguin to bring local produce to their campers. And we engaged St. Paul College culinary students in our preservation efforts. Another exciting partnership is with Cooking Matters, which is a national program and partnered as well with Amory Hospital and Clinic to hold a series of classes for parents of young children who are on a budget. And the series focused on nutrition, cooking, and of course, local food. And one of our most timely programs was our Victory Garden Initiative. We like to say that we unpaved a parking lot and put up paradise. So we turned half of our back parking area into this beautiful victory garden and our produce manager and the hungry turtle farm manager hosted weekly video tutorials from our garden so folks could garden along from home. And an unbelievable 175 people purchased flats of garden starts and planted their own victory garden plots around the Twin Cities in the Amory area. So think about that for a second. That's a lot of very local produce. 
And like our home gardener friends, we too took full advantage of the season's bounty by putting up jams and jellies and pickles so and more so that we can truly eat local year round. Some of those preserves go into our root cellar, which is bursting with a gorgeous array of items that we use on our menu and sell in retail. One of our most popular items has become our signature balsamic onion jam. And in 2021, we look forward to continuing the innovation of 2020. We'll always offer some online programming and now we've created a market for take and bake meals, which we will continue to meet. Our partnerships will continue to deepen and expand, but we hold in our mind's eye the day that we can reunite in person for dining, learning and communing, and maybe even some hugging. So thank you for taking this journey with us. Um, we've really appreciated your support so much. I'm gonna ask Michelle Tigan to join us just briefly. And Mike, did you have anything to add between now and then? No, go for it, Laura. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks, Laura, for the wonderful little intro there. Uh, I'm Michelle Teigen. I will be the incoming board chair for the Farm Table Foundation, and I give my time and energy to this incredible community asset because, as we just heard from Laura and we've heard from Amy as we've followed along, all three of my kids ate dinner while watching you, Amy. We're having a great time. So thank you. Uh, for providing opportunities like this where we get to learn a bit more about the things that, you know, as We've heard tonight that our grandparents valued near and dear and that we are learning in this pandemic to only value more. So many of you on tonight's event are already donors. And so first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for valuing Farm Table. Thank you for valuing the work that they do. We all know COVID-19 has been hard on every nonprofit and Farm Table has found really creative ways as Laura shared to pivot around that and allow us to all have home cooked meals at our table that make us feel even better chefs than maybe we were before we got to watch Amy tonight. So if that is the way that you want to give to Farm Table, I would ask that you continue to support our incredible kitchen and those take home meals. But in addition, if you would consider a gift of any level to help us continue to grow our donor base at Farm Table as a nonprofit, that can be one of the hardest things to do is to grow our donor base in our annual campaign so that we too can continue to do really neat things like this, continue to partner with uh, the food pantry in Amory and the YMCA camps around us to only do more good work and get all generations of young people understanding the value of healthy land, community, local farms that we all hold so near and dear. So I'm gonna put up right now a little link. Oh, Mike did it too. Mike beat me or Jill did um, to the Farm Table Foundation. That's a quick link you can click on, learn a little bit about where your donations go, uh, but really consider a gift to Farm Table. It's one of the best things we've got around. I mean, really, we're all here together doing one of the best Friday nights I've had in a long time. So thanks, Laura. Thanks, Mike. And thank you, Amy. This has been such a, such a great night. I'm happy to do it. And uh, it's really, it's important to me as somebody who lives in a small town or outside of a small town to support uh, rural initiatives, especially. Um, you know, when Aaron and I moved back here, one of the things that we wanted to do was do something for this community, you know, and uh, not, I don't, we don't do anything with food necessarily. Um, I used to do cooking classes though, and that brought a lot of people together around a common table, people who are strangers. That was fascinating and really great. But we do this, uh, we have a nonprofit. Um, we don't have it. We, Aaron's on the board. It's called the Namath Art Center. So just throwing a plug in for that, if that's okay. It's a um, contemporary art center that shows really, really challenging and good work to this area. So I think it's really similar to what you do in that you're pushing that quality thing. You know, you want, you're, you're keeping your standards high and, and you're, you know, being a really good example for, and raising, elevating um, taste and also not pandering to taste or assuming that people don't have it because uh, everywhere people have great tastes. That is not, it's not a geographic thing. It's not a demographic thing. Uh, everybody's born with it, you know? So people can taste food. They know 
what's good. And it really doesn't have to do with class. So that's something to remember, you know, and I just, you know, Mike, you asked me to read something from my book and I don't know if I want to do that, <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, all of our conversations on the phone and from what you guys have said tonight, maybe we can have a little bit of a conversation about something I've been thinking about a lot, which is thrift and value of food. Um, and I'm a little confused about, you know, it's kind of, it's confusing to me because first of all, I, I'm very cheap. I'm incredibly cheap when I go, as much as I'd like to splurge on things like sometimes these oysters from, you know, places uh, far away, most of the time I know, I know how much butter is being sold for and I wish that I could go on the prices, right? Because I know so much, there's so much in my head prices, right? And I don't, I don't know if any of you who are shoppers, family shoppers are the same way, but um, yeah, I'm cheap, I'm thrifty. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I can entertain so much is because, you know, that frugality and that scrimping makes this like endless tent entertaining really possible, you know, because I'm giving it away, right? And, but I'm just kind of curious. It's like food in the cities, like in bigger areas, there's farmer's markets and it's kind of expensive to go to the farmer's market. I don't know about where you guys are in Amory, Wisconsin, but I remember going to a farmer's market in Brooklyn and I was like, oh, that's a beautiful chicken. How much is it? And the guy said, $40. And this was like 10 years ago. And I was just like, ah! you know, and I didn't, I felt bad. I didn't buy the chicken, you know? I'm like, God, I'm a terrible person. I'm like chap and I'm not buying this chicken. I'm not supporting this farmer because, you know, I'm too cheap. And so, <laughs> Um, and then when I moved up here, things are a little bit different. And now this area in northern Minnesota, we're right by where the Mississippi started, um, where it starts, the headwaters. And it's never been a really rich area. Uh, we're seeing, you know, it's just not, you know, it, it's been, people make do, you know, um, even though there are some like multi-million dollar lake captains now around here. But the point is, is that uh, a lot of our friends here we walked into the system of bartering exchange, food exchange, and it's not about money at all. So, you know, people don't even take money for things. Like my neighbor, Marie, she'll come over with like two buckets of crab apples. Like, would she take money? No, she'll take a jar of jam, you know, but you have to have these things to give people because then you feel bad because they won't take any money, right? And our friend Bruce and Bud, they run around, they go to the Amish, they come around, they've got like a chicken run, like a, like a mail run or a newspaper route or something where they're dropping things off to people and everything's really cheap. So, I mean, I don't know. These are contradictions. Like is food expensive or is it cheap? You know, is it too cheap? Is, is, is food too cheap, you know, in a way in this country? where we go into the grocery store and yeah, we're feeding the world, but some of the things are really, you know, they're pretty cheap, but maybe they're not that good. You know what I mean? So I know that, you know, meat, for instance, um, at the same time I go to the grocery store and I'm like appalled that it's, you know, $150. So um, as, as I say that it's cheap, but I'm just saying that, you know, in Europe, let's say like pork rows, that I can buy for $10 here would cost like $35, you know? Um, so there are things that are subsidized. And, and I do think it's really important to frequent and, and, you know, really take advantage of these people who have small farms who are putting their whole livelihood, all everything into these places. Um, and, you know, they need 40 bucks a chicken sometimes you know, and it's worth doing if it's a really good chicken, you know, because you're paying not just for like something that tastes good, but you're paying for that skill, the skill in processing, the skill in, in, you know, keeping it, all that stuff. I mean, it's just so complicated. I don't, I just, I think you can't just slap a price tag on it and explain it. So if anybody wants to comment, please, I mean, I'll keep talking, but um, it's just something I'm kind of working out, you know, like I go to the grocery store, and I'm like with these cheap ladies who are like standing there. We're not just like, 
you know, whipping through there, grabbing everything in the cart. We're like considering, should we get that? Should we get that? You know? Um, and I remember standing next to that, this woman, and she just kind of was talking to herself as people do. And she said, oh dear, avocados are so high. And I was like, they are. I was thinking the exact same thing. Like, why are they so expensive? But I love how she phrased it. They're so high. Or people will say, oh, that's so dear, you know? And I guess maybe that's kind of the, the crux of it really is. Um, if things are too affordable, are they dear? What do they mean to us? You know, if things are, are cheap and then we're not, it, it doesn't mean enough for us. It's not precious enough. You know what I mean? Uh, because we have a lot of food waste in this country where people are throwing things away. And maybe it's because in a way like that broccoli is a little bit too cheap, you know, that you get at the store. So I don't know. I just would love to, I know it's a lot of work, but this pandemic has had the effect of me knowing exactly what's in my refrigerator and trying to be um, as a purchaser, uh, a little smarter, um, a little bit more ethical and a little bit more supportive of the people around me. So I definitely have a lot of local meats in my two deep freezers. Um, I wish I had lamb tonight. I was thinking, oh, we ate all of our lamb, our neighborhood lamb, and I broke one down last year. And I was thinking, oh, I have to go do that again. That was so much fun. It was so delicious. Um, but you know, that's why you need two deep freezers so you have uh, a sampling because otherwise, you know, one hog will fill up an entire 3.5 cubic foot freezer. So, you know. But any thoughts on this, what I'm talking about? Value, meaning, cost, you know, thrift. Anybody else really cheap about food? I think a lot of cooks are. I mean, that that's the quintessential, um, you know, thing about chefs, right? I worked with chefs in New York City and they were incredibly cheap. And they also had high standards. So, you know, they're thrifty. It's not really cheap, it's like frugality. You, But it also, it connects to having meaning for the food, like caring for it, you know, you, you value it. Well, Amy, I'll just chime in briefly in yeah. that, you know, when you say, when we say that food is cheap, it might be cheap for what we pull out of our wallet for it, but we end up paying for it in poor health outcomes, in soil loss and water degradation. All those things are called externalities by by econom economists, and those those externalities right. end up paying. We pay for them eventually, and I just I put in a stat that in in 1960 we paid 17 percent percent 17.5 percent of our income on food. About 10 years ago it was only 9.6 percent. So we pay much yeah. less income on food than we used to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a really. A, I mean, that's the missing, that's one of the missing things, definitely this, my rant about value and thrift and um, cost. It right. is externalities, the externalities, it will pay for it later on. I think that, I think that some of this is um, short term thinking, you know, like the cost of food in America, you know, it's, it can be cheap now. Well, let's just keep it cheap now. Well, what happens down the road, like you said, to the soil, to the water tank? table things like that yeah and i think one of the values that we seek to express at farm table is to in a sense say you know the community that we live in and the community would include soil and water and other people other farmers deserve health as well and and that food system is part of what creates that healthy community absolutely I mean, Park Rapids, where I live, you know, it's home to the largest French fry factory in America. You know, that's our claim to fame. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Artie Offit, they've, they've poisoned a lot of wells um, around here in this place, this area. Uh, we're the Pine Tree Reservoir and Pineland Sands, sorry, it's Pineland Sands. And we have some of the clearest, most delicious, purest water, drinking water. Um, in the state, really. And, and a lot of it's a shallow well system. It's not very deep. So it's done a lot of damage. Yeah. And I remember when the place came to town and it was, you know, it was all about like some sort of tax break or jobs or, but 
that was a long time ago and um they've been caught and gotten better about it but that you know they did a lot of damage like 20 30 years ago so buy organic potatoes i'll just tell you that i see what they do to them it's not good and i would love to hear more about what you're making for the holidays or the new year or anything like that um i'm mostly on instagram at uh amy rose Thielen. that's where you find me and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I'm a lurker on Twitter. I rarely, rarely post, but um, anyway, you can find me there and yeah, I'm here. I might, I also have like an email thing on my website, so. Thank you so much. It was fun to spend the evening with you. Yes, it was so great. This was really fun to see all of your shining faces. The ones I know and the ones I just met tonight and have a great holiday, everybody. You Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Such a Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll do the cookie another time. Okay. Next time. Yeah. Amy, maybe you could mail one to each one of us, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll look forward to it. You know what I, I am doing is um I, I put on Instagram, you know, I have these like uh, book plates. And Mike, did they they reach you? I have these book plates that are like library cards. So yes, if anybody yes. wants their book signed, other Amy, books. I'm glad you mentioned that. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, Amy sent us some signatures and a cute little book plate that looks like a library card. And we have both of her books, Midwestern Tables, her cookbook, and Give a Girl a Knife is her memoir. They're both available at Farm Table. And while we're closed for in-person dining, for safety reasons, obviously, we're open to come pick great stuff up and you can pick up a copy of Amy's book while you're doing that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks again so much to everyone. Thank you so kindly for joining us tonight. Have a really great holiday season and join us again. We've got some fun classes coming up. We'd love to see you on Zoom and in person down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. <laughs> you. Look at the pepper. Look at her food. Look at her food. What are you doing? Hi. Hi. Hey, really? Say hi. Where's the food? She said, where's the pork? All right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.